in James chapter 2, he began to address the subject of partiality. And really what he's addressing is what does a doer, he's answering the question or giving evidence for what a doer of the word does. We've read in the latter part of chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, that's big, one big section there. These are what doers of the word do. Uh, if anyone is a hearer, verse 23, and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. And once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not becoming a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man is blessed in what he does. And then verse 26 and 27, here's what a doer of the word does. He, he is a visitor, one who visits the orphans and the widows. Well, in chapter 2, he has switched topics a little bit, but he hasn't left the building, so to speak. He's still talking about uh, what a doer of the word does. And the first thing he deals with is partiality, and it's the inconsistent practice of partiality in chapter 2 and verses 1 through 13. In other words, prejudice. In other words, looking upon uh, some people as to, be, as to be more worthy or more honorable as anyone else, uh, that's what we're talking about, partiality. You favor, towards, favor someone because they can... They have the capacity to return things back to you, for example. That, that, that's the nature of what we're dealing with. And so in verse 1 of chapter 2, there's an introduction. And in verses 2 through, two through 4, there's a vivid parable there. And verse 4 is the answer. If you do these things that he writes about in verse 2 and 3, if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and someone else comes into your assembly, but he happens to be dressed in dirty clothes. And your reaction is to pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes. And you tell him, you sit over here in this spot, but you say to the guy who's wearing dirty clothes, you stand over there or sit down and by my footstool. Here's the question, the, the rhetorical question. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? And the implied answer is, yes, you have. So why partiality is evil? Now that he's said that, why is partiality evil? Well, verse 5 in the first part of verse 6. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. It's counter to God's pattern. Why be partiality or why partiality is evil is that it's counter to God's pattern in which he works. The second part of verse 6 and the rest of verse 7, is not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? Yes, they do. Why is partiality evil? It's because you, it betrays a, a pathetic groveling toward the very ones who are persecuting Christians. That's why it's evil. But he's not completely through yet. Because this section goes all the way to verse 13. So he tells us that partiality is evil also because it stands counter to God's royal law. That's in verses 8 through 13. So let's read what he has to say there and then we'll make some comments. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality... You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So partiality is evil because it stands contrary to the royal law. So in verses 8 and 9, Paul, uh, G, excuse me, James says love is right and favoritism is sin. That's his moral argument. 
And then verses 13, uh, excuse me, verses 10 through 13, he gives and he shows the consistency of the whole law. Consistency of the whole idea of the God behind the law as well. So you have love is right, favoritism is sin, the moral argument in verses 8 and 9. And then in verses 10 through 13, the consistency, the whole law, the consistency of the whole law working through there. So let's look through this first section. Love is right, favoritism is sin. So you can follow along if you like. I'll read and, and make maybe a comment or two as we read through this, and then we'll go back and make more, more comments. More comments. That's what preachers do. They make comments all the time. If actually or if really, and, and the really the, is, is maybe translated however, but it's really, it's, it's not a however the normal use of a conjunction in the Greek, it's different. This word is, is different. So literally it reads like this. If actually you are keeping or carrying out the kingly law according to the scripture. If really you are carrying out or keeping the kingly law according to Scripture. So if really you are doing this, or if actually you are doing this, you're keeping or you're carrying out the kingly law according to the Scripture. And the reason I say kingly law is because the word royal there is basileus or basilikon. Basilikon is the word for kingdom in Scripture. Basilea is a kingdom, the coming kingdom. So it's the kingdom law, which is interesting, and we'll comment on that in a few moments. So if actually you are keeping the kingly law according to the Scripture, and this, what he's quoting from is Leviticus 19, verse 18, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So you have a protasis, if, uh, if statement condition, You have an appositional statement, which means to say the same thing. You're loving your neighbor as yourself. Then the apodosis, for all you English buffs, you are doing well. If you are doing well. So you have the apodosis and the apodosis. Bet you didn't know this was an English language as well. Hmm? Verse 9. But, contrast, but if you show partiality, and that's the apodosis there. If you show partiality, the apodosis, you are acting or you are committing sin. Committing is the word work, ergon. You are working sin. If you are committing sin, you are acting out sinfully. That's what that, what, what that means. That's what that's saying. So if you show partiality, this is another if statement here, the apodosis is if you show partiality, the, apo- the apodosis is you are acting sinfully or you are committing sin. And the result is this, being convicted by the law as a violator or transgressor or lawbreaker. That's verses, two, or, uh, verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2. This little section here consists of two first-class conditional clauses. You have if in verse 8 and but, but if in verse 9. And they, they are contrasted to one another. And you see the same thing, the same kind of contrast in chapter 3 in verse 17 and 18. Verse 17 says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, Uh, Without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who peace. So you have the same kind of uh, the same kind of construction where you have conditional clauses there, and what the contrasts do in chapter eight verses two, um, chapter two verses eight and nine. What the contrasts do is heighten or emphasize the severity of inconsistent behavior. That's the purpose of it. What are we to? So what if there is a contrast? So what if there are cl- conditional clauses? What does that mean? Well, here's what it means. It heightens or emphasizes the severity of inconsistent behavior. So the message that James wishes us 
to get from verses 8 and 9, one of the messages he intends for us to get is to don't take lightly this kind of behavior. That don't look lightly on, well, so, I, so what if I told him to sit over there and I told this other guy to sit right there? And so what if I took him to lunch but I didn't take him to lunch? If it's all based on what you think you can get from them necessarily or because they may have money or because they may have connections somewhere and you know the motives of your heart, if it's those kinds of reasons why you do these things, don't take this lightly what Scripture says. The severity of the inconsistent behavior is what James wishes us to, to grasp and to come to grips with and uh, ask God to examine our own motives and the things that we do to make sure we are not participating in such kind of behavior. Essentially, partiality is playing the role of God only without one fraction of the capability to do so. In other words, we are not all-knowing, everywhere present, all-powerful, nor do we possess an infinite amount of mercy, wisdom, and justice, all of which must express themselves in perfect measure and impeccable timing. None of us are capable of that, and yet we act as though we're doing God's work by doing some of the things that we do in our, in our life. Verse 8 is the positive statement. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. That's a quote from Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. And James here calls it the royal law. It is literally the word king, kingly law. This is the first time that James directly quotes from the Old Testament. He has alluded to the Old Testament earlier. And he's even alluded to uh, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 15 when he condemned partiality in, in verse 1 of chapter 2. There's an allusion there. And he has echoed the language of the Old Testament on a number of occasions, and we've seen that, no doubt. He refers to this law command as a royal law, and in, this is the way in which it is translated in almost every translation that we have in English is royal law, it's, and that's the way we see it most often. But the word, however, means kingdom. It's the adjective, basilikon, is the Greek word. And you also have the same word in verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the, there's the word again, kingdom. Heirs of the kingdom. So the Greek word here that we have translated royal points back to the related word kingdom in, chapter, in verse uh, 5 of chapter 2. The law of the kingdom. He's calling this the kingly law. The law of the kingdom is what he's calling this. This is the kingdom that the believing poor will inherit. And what I believe James is saying, beloved, is that this law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is the law that rules, is going to rule his kingdom. It's certainly the law that all the other laws sum up. I have, what should I do that I may, um, Matthew chapter 22, just so I don't botch it. Too bad. Matthew chapter 22. And verse um, 30, 34. Matthew twenty-two thirty-four. 34. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. That's what he's saying here. Calling this a kingly law. It is royal because it is the supreme law to which all other laws governing human relationships are subordinate. If this law, when this law will become enforced or when it, become, when it goes into force and it is obeyed perfectly is going to be 
in the, king, in the kingdom, in the coming kingdom. It's the kingly law. It is in verse 5. Those who are rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom to which he has promised to them. What law is going to rule in that kingdom is summed up and you love your neighbor as yourself. So when you hear somebody say, why can't we just all get along? Remember that? Came from California in 1992. Uh, someday we will. It's called the kingdom. When we will love our neighbor as ourselves. That will be the ruling law. But not until. The reason why we can't all get along is because we're all sinners. That's why. And as James chapter 4 is going to tell us, the source of our quarrels and conflicts is our pleasures that wage war in our members. We lust and we don't have, and so we take from somebody else who does have, even committing murder. We're envious and we cannot obtain, so we fight and we argue about it. So that's why we don't all get along. Very simple, really. It's not, it's not that confusing. But this is the royal law. This is the law that governs the kingdom. This is the, this is, and the, we see the importance of inconsistent behavior. If believers, you and I, are representative of a coming kingdom, and we are, and Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, are characteristics of those who will inherit the kingdom, then to act with partiality is grossly inconsistent. And that's why the contrast between verses 8 and 9, that's why James wants to put that out there to show us the seriousness of the inconsistent behavior. It should not be part of us because it's not our God. And it's not the character, it's not the law of the coming kingdom. So that's, that's why it's important. When he says actually or really here, and he says however in most of our English translations probably this conjunction has an adversative meaning in all of its seven other occurrences it's john 4 john 7 john 12 second timothy 2 it's it's adversative in every other occurrence but the context here in james does not favor an adversative aspect or flavor to it what is the opposing idea or verse as we see here if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, we ask, what, uh, what is the opposing idea or verse? Perhaps verse 8 is opposing or in contrast to the first part of verse 6. The first part of verse 6, have you not dishonored, but you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally uh, drag you into court? So here's, here's what I'm suggesting is, is the contrast, because if, however, is a contrast to something. If really, if actually is contrasting something. Here's what I'm suggesting to you. The first part of verse 6, you have dishonored the poor man. Jump to verse 8. If, excuse me, however, here's the contrast. If you fulfill the royal law, you are doing well. The connection is distant. And since really is a possibility for the meaning, it seems better uh, in the context to translate really or indeed, which, which I have, actually or really indeed. That's why I don't, if any of your translations have the words actually, really, or indeed, um, that's, that's why you have that there. The New American Standard says, if however. However does convey a certain contrast there. But um, the paraphrase, as a paraphrase, it would be something like this. On the one hand, if readers really are fulfilling the royal law of loving one's neighbor, then they are doing well. On the other hand, if they are showing partiality, they are committing sin. Now that bleeds right into verse 9. Do you see that, how that bled right into verse 9? On the one hand, if readers really are fulfilling the royal law of loving one's neighbor, then they're doing well. On the other hand, if they show partiality, they are committing sin. If indeed on the one hand you are fulfilling the royal law, but if on the other hand you, are sh you show partiality. So you take verse 6, if you have dishonored the poor man... He says, 
is, is not the rich man who oppress you and personally drag you into court. You have dishonored the poor man. But if you actually, or if you really fulfill the royal law, you're doing well. Moving on to verse 9. On the other hand, if you show partiality, you are committing sin. That's the way it flows. So James is kind of going back and forth with his, uh, uh, with his readers, with his arguments here. Love your neighbor as yourself is, is saying the same thing as keeping the kingly law. They say the same thing, they just say it a different way. Love overlooks superficial distinctions such as wealth and quality of clothing it shows kindness to a person in spite of any distasteful qualities that they may have. It says, you are doing well. And the root means beautifully. Here the sense is acting rightly or correctly. You are acting correctly if you are doing this. And that's the positive. Bleeding over into the negative here, the one who breaks the royal law, he says, but if you show partiality, you are working sin or committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Being convicted is the implication of the controlling verb, which is acting or committing. If you do this, you will be convicted of doing something, of, of uh, acting inconsistently. So, but... Here, here's how it reads. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin with the result of being convicted by the law as transgressors. The result is simultaneous here. It's simultaneous and it's the logical outcome of the uh, controlling verb, which is committing. So uh, look at verse 9. If you show partiality, you are committing sin. When you commit sin there, the simultaneous reaction is that you are convicted as the law as transgressors, convicted by the law as transgressors. Whether you recognize it or not, you are convicted by the law. You stand under the law guilty because of what you did. Well, I didn't realize that law existed. It doesn't matter. You still stand under the law. We said... Officer, I didn't realize I was speeding, but you still were. The result is simultaneous. The result with the result of being convicted by the law is transgressors. So the severity of the transgression uh, conveyed by these nouns in the Jewish conception um, of sin should not be overlooked. And the, the word there is transgression. You cross the boundary. You've, uh, you've crossed the line. You, you have, it has said, do not do something, and you did it anyway. You went beyond the line. You transgressed that line. In the New Testament here, that word transgression is only used twice outside of the Apostle Paul. Paul uses the word transgression in chapter 2 of Galatians and chapter 2 of Romans. Other than that, we only see it here in verse 9, and we'll see it again in verse 11. So by working or committing this sin, they cross over God's established boundaries, is what he's saying. So if we do show partiality, there is a boundary that we have crossed. We, are be we have become transgressors. And the implications here is that this person knows what he is doing, knows that he is doing is wrong. That's the implication. And to continues, if he continues to do it, it's a bold stand or, uh, against the law. It's kind of an in-your-face kind of sin. If you do this, you are committing sin. You have transgressed the law. To continue to do it is kind of an in-your-face bold face kind of sin. And of course, that is not good. Uh, it's never good to shake your fist at God because you, we know, beloved, anybody that shakes your fist at God never wins, right? 
That's what Matthew chapter 10 has told us. If you hang on to this life, if you value this life so much so that you forfeit the next life, you need to understand that you can never keep this life. The life you're living right now can never be kept. You can never preserve it. And again, that's why Jim Elliott said that he is no fool to lose what he cannot keep, this life, to gain what he cannot lose, eternal life. So verses 10 through 13 talks about the whole law. That's the second part of this verses 8 through 13. Verses 10 through 13 is the whole law. And this will go quickly because we can, we can move through here relatively quickly. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So there's the second time that James uses this word transgressor. You cross the lines of what the law says. So this whole law, verses 10 through 13, is broke down into three, three sections here. We do not choose what we obey, verses 10 and 11. There's, there's, it's the whole law, right? And so we do not choose what we obey. If you break one, you're guilty of all. It's the whole thing. That's verses 10 and 11. We are free when we obey, verse 12. That's verse 12. Speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Okay, if we know that we're going to be judged by this law, then we are free to obey it. We're free to... And there's plenty of guidance. Now we are free to obey. We are free to do the things that, that we know are right. And in verse 13, we who receive mercy should show mercy. Judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So verse 10, James says, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. The word has become is the kind of uh, tense that indicates a move into a state of being. And what that means is, is that the one who stumbles in one point of the law moves from this state of being innocent of all the law, move, you move into another state of being, of being guilty of all of the law. So it's a perfect tense is what it is. And the four that we see in verse 10, the four tells us that James will explain how an act of favoritism makes a person a lawbreaker. His reasoning is that to commit one act of sin, which breaks one commandment of the law, makes a person guilty of all of the law. God is, has given the whole law. God is not a person who can be divided up. His personality cannot be split. You cannot wheel and deal with God. There are no, uh, as we noted this morning, there are no uh, politics with God. So if you keep the whole law and yet you stumble in one point, you've become guilty of all. So it doesn't matter if we, I mean, it really does. It doesn't matter if we say, well, I've never stole anything. Well, I've never lied. I've never thought evil of someone else, but I have used the Lord's name in vain. Then you're guilty of all. And since you are guilty, okay, I'm a blasphemer. Maybe I have stolen. Now I'm a thief. Yes, and I have lied. Now I'm a liar. Now why would, I allow, why would I think God would allow me into heaven since I'm a blasphemer, a thief, and a liar? You're guilty of all. You're, you're, you stand before God, not innocent, but guilty. Verse 11, he who said, and here's the reason for, he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. This is all coming from the one God. It's a, a God that's unified on everything that he says. He's not to be, he cannot be divided up and paired out. This one God, God has a law that he has given to, specifically to Israel, the, the Mosaic law. But there's an element that 
the element of, elements of the law that reflect his character, and that is uh, that character crosses time, it crosses cultural boundaries. And it's, the, it's God who said, do not commit adultery, and it is God who also said, do not commit murder. You can't take one at, at the expense of the other. You can't favor one over the other. Now, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you become a transgressor of the law. This is, what, of course, what James wishes to people to understand. You need to understand this. This is a serious matter of which I write you about. If you are guilty of partiality, you are contrary to the character of your own God. This is the law that governs the coming kingdom is that you love your neighbor as yourself and you're doing that you're breaking the very law that governs the coming kingdom. Love your neighbor as yourself is one of the two things that Jesus said all of the law and the laws and the commandments can be summed up into these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. So it is a big deal when we do not love our neighbor as ourself. In verses 12 and 13, the last two verses, he, what we have here is information that says that the law is the basis for future judgment. Verses 12 and 13, the law is the basis for future judgment. And we see here what the law requires. He requ- it requires mercy, what the judge assesses, and that is mercy. And what the Lord what our the Lord demonstrates is also mercy. So we know this is coming. James says to his readers, you know this is true. So align your behavior, your speech, and your actions as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy mercy triumphs over judgment so what the law requires what the judge assesses and what the lord demonstrates mercy so the the opposition of right and wrong behaviors that are found in the two ways ethical tradition the two ways tradition here which james has talked about thus far and he's he's going to continue to do so it, it finds a clear example, or excuse me, a clear illustration in this passage here. If someone favors the rich at the expense of the poor, he is ordering his life according to the wisdom from below, as he's going to say later in chapter 3. That, and that contrasts so strikingly with the mercy that is a fruit of the wisdom from above. If you look over in James chapter 3, verses 14 through 17... Three, fourteen through 17 there. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. Demonic even, he says. Not just neutral, it's demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. So as what James is talking about here, he's showing that it, the, the person who favors the rich at the expense of the poor is functioning as though he is living according to the wisdom from below, not the wisdom from above. And then he gives a description of the wisdom from below and wisdom from above. That's guiding our behavior, and that should not guide our behavior. That is completely contrary to our God. It is completely contrary to how he has dealt with us. Wisdom that comes from God will lead to honoring those to whom God honors Because chapter 2, verse 5 says, These people are rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him. This is not good. The partiality that favors the rich is 
bad fruit and selfishness that comes from below, as chapter 3, verse 14 and verse 16 say. The message can be simply expressed as follows, summing up verses 8 through 13. One cannot dishonor those whom God has honored. One cannot show partiality. One cannot show favoritism just at random because we think that they have something to offer us. Because in reality, God has not dealt with us in such a manner because he knew we had nothing to offer him. And yet he still chose us. So on that basis, on that kind of foundation, on that ethical truth, he found it, he, he found us, he saved us because he chose to, because it was his, it was the pleasure of his good intention to do so. We had nothing to offer. There was nothing for God to be, for God, that God would be, that he would gain by saving us. And so our behavior should be solely for the benefit and for the glory of God and for the benefit of the person that we're working for, for the benefit of the person that we're talking to, for the glory of God. That's how our behavior should be because that's how our Father has acted toward us. So the contrast in verses 8 and 9 shows us that it is important. This is a big deal with God. Sometimes we don't think that, cert, we think that uh, some of the things in Scripture are not quite as bad as others. Well, if we thought that partiality is not quite as bad as some other things, we need to rethink because partiality is bad. Showing favoritism is not good. It is it is, um, it, is a, it is a display of hypocrisy. We say that we follow God who is not a respecter of persons and yet we behave as though there are, we do practice respect of people in some regard, which is contrary to our Father's character. And so that it would be a measure of hypocrisy. We claim to follow him and yet we don't act like him. You hypocrite, you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, you know, Galatians speak, spoke to that a great deal. We are not under law. Uh, some people divide the law into moral, civil, and something else, ceremonial. But the point is, is the Old Testament prophets never divided the law up in that way, nor does the New Testament. The law is the law. 613 commandments, 248 positive 300 and something, or excuse me, 248 negative, 300 and something positive. But the Old Testament never divides the law into three parts like we sometimes do in our theology. So don't divide the law into, yes, there are ceremonial parts of the law. And yes, there are uh, other parts of the law. But Moses, or excuse me, but Paul does not divide those up. He says, you're not under the law, you're not under the law. So we don't have the Ten Commandments is not necessarily over us as part of the law. What is normative for us today, in living today, is what we see expounded in the New Testament. So sacrificial sacrificing is not normative today because the book of Hebrews forbids it. It says Christ, our once for all sacrifice, has been sacrificed. So we don't participate in any kind of um, sacrificial system because all of that has been done away. All of that was a shadow of the things to come. We're not under the law. Uh, sometimes I hear reports of homosexuals making a speech at college campuses and say they chide Christians and they say, if you're really a Christian and obeying the word of God, you should be stoning me right now. 
And I wish some Christian would stand up and say, Sir, you don't know what you're talking about. That's the Old Testament that was given to Israel, not to us. Our job now is to love you as Christ has loved us, not to throw rocks at you. But so far, so far I've heard, nobody knows that. (laughs) I don't know why they're not standing up and saying that and putting them in their place. So the law, and when God goes back to dealing with Israel in the tribulation, he's going to begin to act according to the Old Testament law again. In fact, the Mosaic law says, if you do not obey me, I will scatter you and bring foreign armies, and I will, they will cart you off, which is exactly what has happened. The explanation for why Israel is scattered all over the world is that they, obey, they disobey the Mosaic law. And the reason we believe that God will bring them back to Israel is the Abrahamic covenant. And the law will be the, here's how we live when the kingdom comes. So the relative, the, the, the significance of the law for us is that when we see in places like this, the law codified in you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, Leviticus 19. That's the character of God, and those things are required of God's people, whether you're part of Israel, whether you are part of England in the 15th century, or whether you're part of the United States now. So where Paul says, when you have um, statements like this, that you see the application of these things that are still made for us. The, when he quotes these things, it doesn't mean that we're under law. He's taking a timeless truth that was spoken and put into law form and given to Israel as the way they should behave and what guides their conduct. But that doesn't mean that that part of God's character should not guide our conduct because it's cross-cultural. And that's why so many books have written about what's the role of the law and the Christian because there are so many different views of that. So, um, when we went through uh, the book of Galatians on Sunday morning, I think all of those messages are up. Um, Yeah, you can go back and listen to those. Find a section in Galatians that talks specifically about the law or something, and we probably made some comments about about the law. It's 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 um, we're not under law. We're not under obligation to any of those things. But that doesn't mean the law doesn't have any value. The law has tremendous value because it is the the character of God in code form. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, if you you're you're right. You're right. If you violate this part that's codified in law form, if you violate that the, the original giver, the God who gave the law, how is it that only his right arm is offended and not his left arm? You can't, you can't separate it. It is the one God who gave it. The same God who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Does that make sense? Okay. No, we're not under law. Is it that mean, does that mean it has no value? Of course it has value because it is the character of God. But um, will you stand for, why didn't you stone those people? No, because you're not under law. Yes, sir. Mm 
Okay. Yeah, I, I, I do understand the statement. Christ, Romans 10, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. All the law is met in him. All of God's righteous demands, all of his righteous requirements is met in him. He is fulfillment of the law. Because, you know, uh, the original, remember, the purpose of the law is to bring us to an awareness that we're sinners and we can't save ourselves. So the act of sacrifice in the Old Testament was not a means of salvation. It was an expression of hope. It's an expression of faith that they made. Why did they make that? God told them, here's how I want you to express your faith towards me. By doing this, by doing this, by doing this. So the expression of faith was not to gain his approval. The expression of, or the obedience to those things was an expression of their of their love for God and obeying his commands. Yes. Yes. Yes, and I, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to imply the law has no value. You can just throw it out, wad it up in a piece of paper, and throw it in the fireplace. It still, it has value. There's no doubt it has value. In fact, Romans 2, verses 14 through 16, even when Gentiles who do not have the law are a law unto themselves, their conscience bearing witness that the law written on their heart, or the law written on their heart and their conscience bears witness. We don't know exactly what that law is written, that's written on the heart of every man, but many people, presume or think that it's some sort of co is some sort of ten commandments some basic understanding of god of right and wrong that's he's written on our hearts and our conscience bears witness which explains why there is relative goodness in man so the the law has tremendous value tremendous tremendous value yes sir Yes. Yes. The law has no jurisdiction in us. You're right. The law has no jurisdiction in us. We stand in grace, not condemned under the law. We stand under grace. But still, that the law is still valuable because it does communicate the character of God. So there is value in that. There's much to learn from that. A lie is still a lie. <laughs> that violates, that's contrary to the character of God. So there's the value in one example of that. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, the next section in James is that famous section, right? This right, strawy epistle, Luther said. Um, 
verse 14 through the rest of the remainder of the, the chapter. Faith and works. What's, what's, do I need works here? Do I, do I need only faith? What's the relationship between faith and works? And so we'll be uh, looking at that uh, starting next time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Um, take a couple of minutes to uh, maybe stretch your bones, visit, visit the uh, restrooms if you need to, and we'll come back here and we'll spend probably about 40 minutes or so in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this uh, study tonight. In this matter of partiality, we James has taught us that it is, is not a minor issue. It is a serious issue with you. And so, Father, we need to align our thinking and rearrange our habits and our philosophy so that it does conform to your scripture. Father, we teach us, help us to understand the, the, uh, that injustice is not pleasing to you. And may we not, not act unjustly toward others. We ask, Father, that we would reflect this truth that we've studied here these past few weeks in our life and that we would reflect it accurately so that your, your name might be glorified. And when we have opportunity to speak to others of the glorious love poured out in our Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son, may we do so not being ashamed of the gospel, but with all the confidence that you have sent, the, all the confidence that you have given to us through the study of your word that this is truth and this is what man needs to set himself free from sin. So we thank you, Father, for communicating to us. Your word is sufficient. It is efficient. It is all that we need. And the Spirit of God dwells in us, gives us understanding, convicts us when we do not live the truth, brings to our mind memory, uh, scripture that we have memorized and things that we have studied. And we thank you for that guidance, for that leadership in our life. Father, we ask that you would strengthen all of us and that you would supply all of the needs in our life. You know them. They are many. We are needy people. But you continue to... to care for us as a good shepherd and we praise you and we thank you for that in jesus name amen okay take a couple of minutes and we'll we'll gather back here